Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. I'm a producer and editor here in the Author Events Office. And tonight, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Deirdre Blair. Uh, Bear, excuse me. Uh, Deirdre Bear won the National Book Award for her biography of Samuel Beckett, lauded by the Christian Science Monitor as, quote, the best introduction to an enigmatic giant of 20th century literature, end quote. Uh, her other acclaimed biographies in, uh, include portraits of Simone de Beauvoir, Carl Jung, uh, Al Capone, and I looked this up and maybe I can get some uh, confirmation on this pronunciation afterwards, Anais Nin. Uh, that's how Dominic Dunn says it anyway. Her books have twice been finalists for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and she is the recipient of Guggenheim and Rockefeller Foundation Fellowships. Bear's latest work returns to two of her biographical subjects, revealing new insights into their characters through the ways each was inextric inextricably linked to the other. It's called Parisian Lives, Samuel Beckett, Simone de Beauvoir, and me. In it, she travels nearly 50 years into the past to explore the relationships she had with these literary peers, but occasionally mortal enemies, and the disparate approaches she used to garner intimate insight into their lives in literature. Two quotes jumped out at me in writing tonight's introduction. The first is from de Beauvoir. It says, one's life has no value so long as one attributes value to the life of others. And the second one is from Beckett. Words are all we have. And so with that in mind, let's hear from tonight's esteemed guest. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Deirdre Blair, Bear, I did it again, <laughs> to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you. I think I'll start out tonight by telling you uh, uh, when I got my copy of uh, the Beckett biography, can you hear me now? You can't hear me? Okay. When I got my copy of the Book of the Month Club edition of the Samuel Beckett biography, they had spelled both my names wrong. <laughs> they called me Deidre Blair. <laughs> so anyhow, <clears throat> I'm delighted to be back here in Philadelphia. Um, I went to Penn as an undergraduate, and I was a professor at Penn for a number of years. I met my husband on Franklin Field when I was a junior at Penn and he was a senior at the Naval Academy. And uh, I tell you this because it's sort of a preface to uh, the book uh, that you have before you, The um, Parisian Lives and how I came to write it. I, um, I was married my senior year in college and uh, I had prepared myself for a career in print journalism. It was all I ever wanted was to be a reporter. And uh, my husband was uh, sent with the Sixth Fleet all over Europe. My first job was at Newsweek. And when I said, well, I'm going to quit to follow the ship, uh, my wonderful editor said, no, no, don't do that. You can, you, you, you can be a stringer. You can go all over Europe. You can send news back to New York, which is what I did. And that was quite rare in those days. But I started in Scotland and ended in Turkey. And then shortly after, when my husband left the service and he went to graduate school at Yale, I was still doing print journalism. And uh, <clears throat> I was working in those days uh, for the New Haven Register. I was the sole support of the family with the exception of his fellowship uh, at Yale. And um, I, was, uh, I had two little children. I had them in quick succession, my family. And um, I was burned out. Uh, news doesn't happen between 9 and 5. And I was finding it very, very difficult. And the time, the time, the late 60s, the early 70s, women weren't working, particularly women of my social class. They were, uh, if they did work at all, it was only until their husband finished his professional training and then they went home and became the perfect wife. So I was an anomaly from the very beginning. I was in my mid-20s and I was utterly burned out. I was trying to be it all and do it all. I was trying to raise a family, be the perfect wife, uh, entertain for my husband, um, just do everything that women were required to do, and I just couldn't do it anymore. And through a series of happy accidents, and this, of course, um, I have to tell you that the first title for this book, um, my publisher wanted to call it The Accidental Biographer because everything that sort of happened in my career happened accidentally. 
I went to graduate school. I went to the right graduate school, but I went for the wrong reason. We were living in New Haven, and I, I had a Danforth Fellowship. I could have gone to Yale, or, or I could have gone to Columbia, which is where I did go. And I thought, I'd better go to Columbia, because what if I fail? I can always say commuting got to be too much for me. But if I fail in New Haven, everyone's going to know it. <laughs> and that's how women thought in those days. That's how we thought in the early years of the second wave of feminism. So anyhow, as I said, I was in the right place um, for me. And uh, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this book came into being. Um, I became a biographer uh, during graduate school when um, everything was French theory. Uh, there was anyone who even thought of, of looking at a writer's life uh, was um, suspect, uh, if not totally denounced in graduate school. Everything was French literary theory. There was this wonderful uh, little poem that I read some years back. Um, and I will mispronounce Jacques Derrida's name deliberately to give you the poem. Um, this is the story of Jacques Derrida. There ain't no writer. There ain't no reader either. <laughs> well, I was the reader who said, wow, where did that novel come from? Was the, uh, was the author worried about paying the rent? Did he have a sick child? Did he have a deeply hidden sexuality? I kept looking for the writer, and my professors kept saying, you're never going to get a job. You know, you're, you're never going to get a degree if you keep doing this. But I kept doing it. And that's how I came to write biography. I went to um, my, uh, after I had the degree, I went to my advisor at Columbia, and I said, um, I'm really going to go through with this. I, I'm going to write about Samuel Beckett. I'm going to write his biography. What a lot of chutzpah for a 27-year-old woman um, who, had, who had never read biography. And here she was planning to write one. And so um, I, I went to my advisor to tell him this. And he said, well, don't you think you ought to let Samuel Beckett know? So he said, you need to write him a letter. You need to do something, you know. You can't just start writing. Well, I thought I could. I had been a newspaper reporter, and I had written feature stories all the time. And you just write a feature and print it. But, you know, he introduced words to me like contracts and legal issues and <laughs> on and on. I thought, oh, dear. So I did write a letter to Samuel Beckett. Um, and it was agony for me to compose it. Um, I started telling him that I had, um, I had come to him through James Joyce. I had studied Joyce extensively. And the common uh, thought about Beckett in those days was that he was the poet of alienation and isolation and despair. And I kept finding real places in his fiction in Ireland. And I kept finding real people, uh, caricatures of famous Dublin characters. And so I thought, you know, the critics have it all wrong. We need a biography to open up Beckett's scholarship, and I, I shall be the one to do it. So I wrote him this letter, sent it off. It took me a week to write it, hot July uh, day. And the mail to and from France has never been that fast since then. Uh, a week later to the day, I had his reply. And he wrote me a letter, and this is what it said. Dear Mrs. Bear, my life is dull and without interest. The professors know more about it than I do. And that was all written in a very careful hand, tiny hand from left to right across the page. And then there was a very hasty scrawl that began at the bottom of the page and went up to the top. And it said there was no punctuation. And it said, any biographical information I possess is at your disposal. If you come to Paris, I will see you. And so off I went. So 
this is, uh, this is the first thing Samuel Beckett ever said to me. So, you're the one who is going to reveal me for the charlatan that I am. Now imagine me, as I said, very young, fairly innocent in those days in terms of biography. We were in the hotel where I was staying uh, on the Rue Jacob in Paris, which is now a very grand street of fairly grand hotels. But in those days, it was $19 a night, and poor graduate students stayed there. And the heat had, uh, the boiler had failed in the hotel, and there had been no heat or hot water for 24 hours. And I had not had coffee or a bath. And I was afraid to leave the hotel for fear I'd get hit by a bus, and I'd never meet Samuel Beckett. So I was sitting in my room with hat, gloves, coat, waiting for him, and he was a stickler for punctuality. There's a scene in his first novel, Murphy, where Murphy stands with the key in the keyhole, and he waits until it's precisely 2 o'clock. He hears the bells chiming, and then he opens the door and goes in. That was Beckett. I was once four minutes late for an appointment, and boy, did I hear about it. So at any rate, this first meeting, he comes precisely at 2 o'clock, and we're sitting in this tiny little... Um, lobby, and there are these two Portuguese maids who are fighting in two languages over an antique singer uh, treadle sewing machine, and they're screaming at each other, and I'm trying to introduce myself to Samuel Beckett, who had just had surgery for his eyes. He had, his eyes were degenerating, and he had to look at me straight on, and he had to be very close to see anyone. And very disconcerting because he had very pale blue gull's eyes, as he called them, when he wrote about his own eyes in his various works. And so we sat down um, at a little tiny table, and uh, it was like one of those ice cream uh, tables and chairs that you used to see in old uh, apothecary places. And um, both of us are tall and we have long legs and it was so difficult to arrange ourselves at this table and I kept bumping in his legs and he had to lean very close because he had to see me and um, he had something, brown packet, I don't know whether they were cigarettes or uh, cigars to this day, I don't know. And I was fussing with him and he reached over and he grabbed them out of my hand and he sat down and then he said those alarming first words to me about me revealing him to be a charlatan. And I was so amazed that I started stammering and I said, oh dear, and I remember my head seeking, sinking into my hand. I said, I, I don't really think I'm cut out for this biography business. Uh, remember, I didn't know what I was doing in those days. And he said, he was a very courtly gentleman, very polite and always eager to put whoever he was with at ease, and he realized how uncomfortable I was. And his demeanor changed at once, and he said very quietly, well then, why don't we talk about how we're going to do this? And that's how it started. And so, um, um, this is... Um, how uh, we worked. We had uh, a meeting that day, and then the next day he came to uh, the hotel again uh, to, so that we could start the interview process. Uh, we talked about uh, how I would want to write the book, and uh, as I had no idea how biographers worked, uh, I just simply said, well, um, uh, you're going to answer all my questions, and you're going to introduce me to your family and your friends, and you're going to show me manuscripts or any other documents that I want, and you're not going to have any control over it, and when I'm finished writing it, I'll publish it, and then you'll read it. Well, I mean, that's just an astonishing way for a biographer to work. And to my amazement, now, but not then, I took it for granted then, he said, okay, that's fine. So um, the next day we went to um, uh, the Tabac, a little place next door, uh, to sit down and talk and start the interview process. And to make conversation as we were getting ourselves situated, 
I asked him where he had lived when he was a student at Trinity College. You know, what were the rooms or what were the streets or so on and so forth. And he rattled off a series of numbers. Well, this corridor, that number, this room, that whatever. And because I have severe math anxiety, I was frantically reaching for my reporter's notebook and my pencil to write everything down. And he jumped up and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm getting ready to start the interview. This is what I wrote in the book. Suddenly he jumped up and he shouted, what are you doing? I tried to explain, but he interrupted me. No pencils, no paper. We're just having conversations. We are just two friends talking. You must never write down anything that we say and don't even think of a tape recorder. And as if this were not unsettling enough, he added something seemingly bizarre. And you must not tell others that I meet with you ever. Well, I was utterly stunned by this because I was so used to keeping careful written records. So I had to figure out how was I going to work? How was I going to interview this man and remember, remember everything that he said? And I hit upon a system that I called intellectual solitaire. I wrote each question I wanted to ask him on a small file card, and I laid them all out on hotel room beds or apartment dining room tables, wherever I happened to be staying at the time. And I committed them all to memory. And in the process, I would shuffle them, and I would rearrange them and reshuffle them and sometimes rewrite them, always trying to make them more precise, more meaningful, and oftentimes to make them less li likely to anger or offend Beckett, which I did frequently. I never slept well on the nights before we met as I would get up to fuss over each card one more time. And after each interview, I'd rush back to my hotel or my apartment, set up my notebook and my tape recorder, and document everything that I could remember that he had told me. For example, he might have said, oh, he's a nice fellow, but he might have meant that sarcastically. So I'd write that down. Days later, I was still figuring things from our conversations. So I took the carrying little notebooks so that I could remember everything that he told me. And remembering and reconstructing was an ongoing process throughout the six or eight years that I wrote Samuel Beckett's biography. So, okay, um, as I said, it took me close to seven years because he lived in Paris and I lived in Connecticut and um, I had to get the money <clears throat> to go and do the research. So I had lots of friends who were on various faculties at Connecticut colleges and whenever somebody went on sabbatical or had a leave of absence for some reason, I'd fill in for them. So I would teach for a semester to get the money to go to Paris the next semester. Fortunately, my husband uh, by that time had become a museum administrator and uh, we were able to uh, go often in the summers and to take our children with us. So my children um, have very fond memories of literally growing up in Paris and I'm delighted to say that they both speak very good French today. So, okay, the book was published, and uh, oh boy, was I in for it. I was, as one of my colleagues, when I began to teach, said to me, don't you think you have been overly aggressive and ambitious to write this book? Don't you think you overstepped the boundaries for women? So there was a group of men who I call the Becketeers, sarcastically, and any reference to the Musketeers, you're welcome to. <clears throat> and um, they were uh, determined uh, to sabotage the book. Richard Elman, for example, wrote in the New York Review of Books that Deirdre Bear has managed a scoop in which literary history is like that of Bernstein and Woodward in political history. She found in a shooting gallery a big duck or a drake named Beckett and she took aim and she brought him down. His insinuation was clearly one that I had been getting from re reporters all over the country who were interviewing me for features. What did she do to persuade him to cooperate? It was best voiced by a reporter for the Hamden, Connecticut Weekly Chronicle who asked me straight out what every reviewer and interviewer from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon also felt free to ask. 
How many times did you have to sleep with Beckett to get this scoop? It would seem that a woman could not be possessed of a brain, only a vagina. And I'm sorry to say there's a footnote on this page. I regret to say that in 2017, a friend of one of my writer friends asked him to demand of me, demand how many times I had to sleep with Beckett to get him to cooperate. I could only ask myself a little over a year ago, doesn't anything ever change? But the book has never been out of print since it was published in 1978 and it's translated in 16 languages. And praise of another kind came from Orhun Pamuk, the Turkish novelist and Nobel Prize winner. Several years after publication, I met him in New York, and he told me that he had bought a copy in Paris, and because it was banned in Turkey, he had to take great care to smuggle it into the country. And there he passed it around to all his literary friends who read it so closely that they shattered the binding and wore down some of the pages. And by the time they had finished, the pages were loose inside the cover. He told me it was the most revered study of Beckett in his country, and he thanked me for writing it. And I was so deeply moved that I had to excuse myself and go in the woman's room to compose myself. So I swore I was never going to write another biography as long as I lived, what I had been through and what I had put my family through. And about a year and a half went by, and uh, my husband, uh, by that time, he was uh, uh, the chief administrator, the associate director here at the Penn Museum. And I was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. And we were living here in West Mount Airy. And um, he was going to Boston for um, a museum conference. And I decided to go with him to relax and enjoy myself. And my agent said, oh, there's this editor in Boston who's been wanting you to write a biography for years and years. You need to have lunch with him. He'll give you a glorious lunch, and you'll enjoy yourself. So even if you never write another biography, at least go to lunch. So I went to lunch with this wonderful editor at a place called Maison Robert, which isn't there anymore, but it was a marvelous restaurant in Boston. And we're sitting there, and we're chatting, and we're having the best time. And he's telling me that I have to write another biography. And I'm saying, if I ever write another biography, after what I've been through, it has to be about a woman. And it has to be about a woman who made a success of everything. She had to have a brilliant personal life and a brilliant professional life. And she had to be extremely happy in every aspect of her being. And so he said, well, you know, well, there are women. Let's find one. So we started throwing names around. and. Nothing clicked, and to this day, he and I uh, josh each other as we say, I said it first, and he says, no, I said it first, Simone de Beauvoir. And I said, well, yes, of course, the perfection of her life with Jean-Paul Sartre, of course. So I wrote her a letter, and she replied immediately, as Beckett had done. Uh, the Beckett book had been translated into French, so I had sent it to her. And she, uh, she said she welcomed me because uh, all anybody wanted to write about in 1980 when I started was her feminism. And she said, I wrote philosophy, I wrote novels, I wrote plays, I wrote so many different things, and you're the first one who wants to write about everything. So I went to meet her um, at her uh, apartment, uh, and uh, she lived on a little street, the Rue Solcher, and if you go down um, a big boulevard in Paris, there is a big statue in the middle of the street, the Lion of Belfort. And she lived at one end going from the Lion of Belfort. And if you went straight the other end, that's where Beckett lived. And it never failed that every time I went to interview her, I would run into him. And they hated each other. <laughs> and here's why. When he was an unknown writer, he had taken a story to Jean-Paul Sartre's magazine, Les Temps Modernes, which everybody knew Simone de Beauvoir did the work. She was the editor, the one who put the magazine out. And he gave her the first half of the story. And she printed it. She didn't understand it, but, you know, why not? And so he came back several weeks later, and he said, oh, I had this wonderful reception. Remember, he was unknown in those days. And here's the second half of the story. 
And she said, oh, we've had enough of your nonsense. We're not printing anything any anymore from you. And he never forgave her for that. He cordially detested her. He was so angry with her that if you read his collected letters, which were put together after his death, you will see that there is this letter that he wrote to her in which he's scathing in his denunciation of her stupidity and her arrogance and on and on and on. So anyhow, here I am thinking that I wrote a biography. I know how to do it. Of course, the second biography is going to be very much like the first. So she invited me to see her on January the 9th, which was her birthday. And uh, I agonized all day long. What do I do? Do I take her a present? She told me to come at 6 o'clock. People are going to be there. She'll be all dressed up. She'll be, you know, being wined and dined. And maybe she got the time wrong. Maybe I got the date wrong. Anyway, I didn't know what to do. And I showed up uh, with a huge bunch of wilting tulips and yellow acacia that somebody at the metro station was, uh, who was closing up for the day was going to throw away if she didn't sell them. So I took them and I went to her apartment. And it was one of these moments like um, in the cartoons, you know, Woody Woodpecker, where they come to the edge of a clip and then they drop down. I thought she opened the door and I'm looking straight ahead. And then I had to look down. She was so tiny. And I always thought from her photos that she was a large woman. She was so tiny. And I, my, one of my first thoughts was, Sartre must have been so much smaller because in every photo of the two of them together, she's the taller. So anyway, there she was in a ratty old bathrobe and what I came to call the ubiquitous rag, rag which was the turban she always wore. And it's her birthday, and it's 6 o'clock at night. And uh, she said, well, come in, sit down, let's get to work. And I said, well, you know, it's your, it's your birthday. Uh, aren't you going out? Aren't people coming to take you to dinner? Uh, it's just another day. Let's get to work. Well, I hadn't brought anything with me. Uh, I would had a very small purse. I thought, you know, this is going to be a meet and greet, and that's going to be it. So the only thing I had that I could possibly pull out to write on was my uh, date book, which, uh, you know, was totally filled with, like, children's orthodontia appointments and things like that. And I would have sort of had to write around the edges of the margin. And so she sat down and she said, okay, here's how we're going to work. I'm going to talk. I'll tell you everything. You can tape record. I'll tape record as well. You'll write everything down. And then we'll have the book and you'll publish it. <laughs> and it was another one of those, oh, dear, moments. And... I said, I don't think I can do that. I think this book is finished before we even get started. And she said, well, how did you work with him? Meaning Beckett, of course. And I said, I explained to her the freedom that he had given me. And there was this very, very long silence after which she said, well, if you work with him that way, I suppose you have to work with me that way. So their animosity toward each other worked in my favor. <laughs> And that was that was how I uh, how I uh, how I wrote that book. Um, she was wonderfully uh, honest. She never evaded questions, but sometimes she wouldn't answer them. Um, I called it the Lucite curtain. I would ask a question, and she would answer it, and then she knew that I would ask the next question, and maybe the question after that was getting into touchy territory. And it was like an invisible, huge, lucite, thick plastic curtain would come down. And I could see her, and she could see me. And never the twain were going to meet. She wasn't going to answer that question. Eventually, she would. I would come back to it uh, time after time. One of the most um, s strange and fascinating uh, examples of how I worked with her, I was trying to get to what she and Sartre had done during World War II. Uh, their hands were not dirty, but they weren't entirely clean either. And uh, she didn't like the way the questioning was going. And she jumped up and she said, okay, we're finished. You have to go. Uh, 
and it was a winter day and I had a coat and a scarf and gloves and I had things I had to bundle up and I'm trying to gather everything up. She's kicking me out of her apartment and we've been working together for three years and now what do I do? And I didn't move fast enough so she literally shoved me out the door of her apartment. And then I thought, well, now what do I do? I've invested three years in this book. Well, I simply went back for the next appointment that we had scheduled as if nothing had happened and she treated me exactly as if nothing had happened, and that's how we work. Um, I'm going to finish up now by saying that um, I had most of the book already finished, and uh, uh, I just needed to do fact-checking. So I went back to Paris at the end of March 1986 for three weeks uh, to do my fact-checking, and it was wonderful. She looked healthier than I had seen her in ages, and uh, we had a very, very good meeting. And uh, we, she, she actually hugged me when I left. Uh, she's such, as I said, very tiny and I'm very tall. And she sort of put her hands over my elbows, which for me was a hug. It was as close as anything that had ever happened. And so I went home feeling so good. You know, she's so healthy. This is terrific. She's going to be around to read the book uh, when I finish. And three weeks later, she was dead. Uh, and it was so unexpected. So, of course, I went back uh, for the funeral. And I just want to read a couple of passages about the funeral. Um, I was marching uh, on, on the street. I had, I had been in the hospital where her body was laid out to say goodbye to her. And um, um, this is what I thought. She looked bloated and yellow. The red rag as I called her turban, was on her head, and she was in the by now ratty-looking red robe. They had her head propped up in the coffin, which gave her fat double, ch double chins that she didn't have in life. Her sister said she looked like she was sleeping, but I thought she looked terrible. The hardest moment came for me as we filed past, because at the same time as we were saying our last goodbyes, there were very businesslike little French men, noisily and officiously, screwing down huge screws into the coffin so they could close it. I knew a real feeling of community as we marched with so many different people. There were young mothers with babies in strollers. A father had a toddler on his shoulders, and he told us she was too young to understand the occasion, but when she was older, he was going to tell her that she had attended the funeral of a great lady. There were African men and women in colorful native dress, some who had come from African countries and bore banners proclaiming themselves the daughters of Simone de Beauvoir. Famous people were there, French actors, um, photographers, uh, politicians, four uh, members of uh, the current government. A small fracas interrupted our reveries and turned our sad faces into smiles and laughter when a taxi driver who had been honking his horn was told to shut up and show respect because this was the funeral of a very important woman. When we told him it was Simone de Beauvoir, he parked his cab and he joined my small group, linking arms with us and saying we should probably sing patriotic songs. The cortege passed slowly down the Rue Saint-Jacques because the crowd estimated at between three and 5,000 people pressed so close to the hearse. People wanted to touch it and it was swamped with flowers. It took a while for police to make enough room for it to pass. The car traveled slowly through Montparnasse, the arrondissement where Beauvoir had lived her entire life. Eventually, it reached the boulevard where waiters stood respectfully outside the Dome, the Select, and La Coupole in honor of the woman to whom they had served countless meals and drinks. The crowd became so dense that the police took two bullhorns to yell, keep walking. We got to the grave. The crush was frenetic. It started to rain, but no one wanted to leave. We all stayed, it seemed forever, inside the cemetery and outside the gates. And after that, I went to a gathering uh, with her sister and her other relatives. And um, suddenly, uh, in the middle of that gathering, I realized that I was deeply emotionally affected, and I got very shaky and weepy, and I knew that I had to leave. 
So I said goodbye to everyone, and I went over to a cafe near the Jardin de Luxembourg, and I sat down and I drank a large cafe creme trying to unwind. I drink the warm, milky coffee and I feel better. My emotions are under control now, and I will take the bus back to my apartment. And there I was trying to manage a light dinner of fruit and cheese between telephone calls with friends who had been with me on that last sad walk from the hospital to the cemetery. And I wrote, we all seem to need to touch base in our common emotional distress. One of my friends calls to tell me that on her way home, she bought flowers for the living herself. I go to bed and I fall into a deep sleep and at last this day is done. Well, the day was done, but the book wasn't. I had to rewrite almost the entire book. The first thing, it was finished, it was ready to go. It took me another year to work on it. Things so simple as putting all the verbs in the past tense. Uh, there wasn't gonna be any new work to disturb the canon. The canon was final, it was finished, it was complete. And I had to make everything final and finished and complete. And so anyway, I'm going to stop here and I'm hoping that you'll read the book and read about my wonderful adventures uh, for yourself and I'll be happy to take questions and thank you. I'm so pleased you're here. I finished reading your book last night. It's terrific and um, among uh, the issues I hope you would, would like to hear you comment on is the issue of women biographers writing about men women biographers writing about uh, women, and male biographers writing about women. Uh, I'm often invited to be on programs uh, with male biographers who have written about women, and everybody just, you know, takes it for granted. It's perfectly fine that a man can write about um, a woman, but when a woman writes about a man, it is, to this day, an entirely different proposition we don't understand or whatever, we're just all sorts of opprobrium is heaped upon us for having the nerve to do that. Um, one thing, uh, women, women's biographies, uh, despite the wonderful biographies of women that we've had, beginning with my dear friend Nancy Milford's biography of Zelda, and Nancy Milford has done so much for me, um, to further my career. If you, uh, if you read the book, you'll see, see what I've written about her. Uh, despite that book and all the wonderful books that come after it, um, uh, yeah, as one reviewer uh, said when Nancy's book was published, um, don't bother with this. It's only his wife. Read about Scott Fitzgerald instead. Uh, and I had some of that. And uh, I went to um, uh, a program at Harvard at the Center for European Studies, a very distinguished gathering with eminent political scientists. And I and um, one of Sartre's biographers, Annie Cohen Solal, we were invited to speak about our work. And I had slaved over my lecture. I had, I had written extensively and thoroughly about all of her political activity. And I could see all these men because they were men in the audience. There, I think there were two women out of maybe 40 or 50 people total. And all the men were taking notes on everything that I said. And I was so excited. I thought, this is going to be a great Q&A. Every question they asked Annie about Jean-Paul Sartre was his work. Every question they asked me was her sex life. And this was 1983. 1983. And I, I, wish, I wish I could say it's gotten better. And in some ways, I guess it has, but there is still sort of this uh, feeling that um, if we write about women, the women we write about are second rate, they don't matter, they're not first rate, they don't deserve biographies. In many instances, people have actually said that to me about fine books uh, my fellow women uh, biographers have written. So it's a very, very touchy subject. I can only hope that because of books like yours and because of um, the way uh, uh, Marjorie and I belong to a seminar in New York, uh, The Women Writing Women's Lives, and um, we take our work very seriously. And uh, I'd like to think that we're having, having an influence. So it's a very long answer to your question, but it's really something I think about all the time. <laughs>
Thank you very much for coming. It's always enjoyable to remember you at Penn. Um, so I have a question about Bowery. When um, Blanche Wiesen Cook wrote her first volume of Eleanor Roosevelt, right. I couldn't put it down. And remember, it was supposed to be two volumes. The second volume, I couldn't get through because she had so much data. And so the, and I don't think she's done volume three yet. But it's out, no, it's out. Is it out? Okay, well, I haven't finished two yet. Anyway, so the question I have is, when you have so much data, like she had of Eleanor Roosevelt, how do you make a decision what to leave out? Well, that's, that's uh, a very real problem for everyone, uh, not only in biography, but in everything from history or whatever. And I always, uh, I always have to resist picking up my red pencil and writing in the margin, your research is showing. Uh, you have to find a way to uh, hide your research and you, you, you have to be ruthless with your own wor uh, work. You have to know, I, for example, there may be a minor essay, and I know I'm going to maybe say two sentences, maybe a paragraph at the most, but I still have to write 15 pages about this minor essay because I don't know what those two sentences are going to be. And so then when the time comes that I'm putting the book together, I call it my three Ps, my passionate purple prose, and I know it has to go. And even so, when I get to my wonderful editor who, who's worked on my last three books, um, He'll say uh, there's a lot more three Ps that has to go, and there usually is, and he's usually right. So you're absolutely right to notice that. Sometimes we, we've done the research and we simply can't resist letting it show, and we shouldn't. Well, I remember going to an MLA meeting when you were talking, and I was at Penn too. I'm Dillis. Hello. <laughs> Hi. And I wondered, I can't remember if you gave your lecture in the English section or the French section. And I remember I was absolutely astounded because nobody seemed to be interested because you were an English professor and here you were writing <laughs> about a French woman. Oh. And I wondered how, how you, it seems to me it was an added layer of complication that you decided that you would write about French people, and I wondered why your choice, it made it difficult for you too, because as you say, you had to travel. So what was it exactly that allured you to go to France and do your research and writing there, taking many, many years to complete one biography? Well, when I started with Beckett, I thought I was writing about an Irish writer. And I, as I said, I had done extensive scholarly work on Joyce. Uh, to this day, I still teach Joyce whenever anybody invites me to do it. And um, uh, I knew so much about Ireland, and I thought I was writing about an Irish writer. And then, of course, when I got to France, they considered him French. And uh, so uh, when I wrote about Beauvoir, I was writing about a woman, uh, and I was uh, becoming a feminist myself. I was involved in consciousness raising, and I was involved in feminist gatherings uh, in and around New York uh, where I was living. And uh, I thought I was writing the life of a woman. It, it never occurred to me until I was deep into the second book that here I am in France again. <laughs> and. Uh, I'd, I'd better get my French really up to speed. <laughs> and so then I began um, speaking at both French and English um, gatherings. And uh, you're, you're right, it was another layer of complication. Uh, the people who would say, you know, this isn't scholarship, it's only biography, which is something that I heard repeatedly. They would also say, well, you know, how can we take her seriously? Here she is in an English department and she's writing about French people. So, yeah, complications. Thank you very much. Are there questions for the back in the room? Yes, sir, uh, please wait for the mic. What did uh, Beckett think about the book? <clears throat> and did you stay friends with him? Or what, what was his reaction? His reaction was very interesting. The first book off the press was mine. I kept it. And the second one went to him, airmail special delivery. And he replied very uh, promptly. And he said, seems a very handsome looking book. <laughs> <laughs>
he claimed that he never read anything anyone wrote about him, and I knew that wasn't true because every now and again he'd let it slip. He was so familiar with anything anyone ever wrote about him. And uh, several years later, um, one of the Becketeers who was trying to denounce me um, was in his presence at a dinner party. There were six people at this dinner party, and the other five told me what Beckett said. He, he stopped the man cold in his tracks. He said, she got it right. So I guess that's what he thought about it. Um, so uh, writing about Simone de Beauvoir, she had already written autobiographies at the time that you were four writing. Them, four autobiographies. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered, and she's kind of known for mm, like sort of evading yes. information in autobiographical work. So I was wondering about how you approached asking her questions about things that she may have sort of uh, put a shadow around in her autobiographical work. Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct to point out that although she wrote four volumes of autobiography, they were very, very public, and they revealed almost nothing about her except what she wanted you to know. So I had to ask her all kinds of questions. I interviewed all the people who were close to her, her family members, particularly her sister and, um, and her, her, her brother-in-law, uh, Sartre was dead by the time I started, and this is this is very funny. Very early on, uh, six months after I started the Beckett book, um, a man named John Jurassi, who had been a, a Sartre scholar, uh, said to me, "Well, I have to have lunch with Sartre and Beauvoir today, and you need to come along because she likes American women, and you can keep her busy so I can talk to him. I don't want her interrupting me. See how they treat women." And I said, oh my God, I'd walk over hot coals to meet Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. This was like 1974, 75. But I had to meet Beckett at two o'clock and I knew I didn't dare be late. And they weren't having lunch until 1.30. So I never met her then. But anyway, that's just his little sidebar. But um, uh, I, I just would ask her the questions. And I, I used a lot of te tennis metaphors when I was putting them together. You know, I'll make uh, very soft blobs uh, very soft passes down the side, and then all of a sudden I'll slam one over the line or hit her in the net. And uh, so I would lead up to questions, um, you know, particularly her sexuality, for example, which was very complicated and complex. And um, uh, I could see the loose side curtain was going to come down. And the way I got her to really engage on her sexuality happened because two women who were uh, claiming they were going to write a biography of her when I was writing mine um, told her that the only thing I was going to write about was her sex, her lesbianism, and she was furious. She never wanted to call herself a lesbian, although her sexuality was very complicated. So I said to her, well, um, I guess we better talk about it. You better tell me. We've talked about everything else. Let's talk about this. So um, she, um, it's a very funny passage in the book. I won't give it all away, but she claimed that no one could ever call her a lesbian because she didn't do anything. And I said, what does mean? And she said, down there. <laughs> Anyhow, you can read the full details in the book. Thank you. More questions? Uh, right back there, sir. Thank you. So from writing Beckett till now, have you developed a single style of mm. interviewing and researching? No, no. Every book is different. You can't. You simply can't. Every biography has its own demands. And every, um, every way of working uh, is absolutely different. Uh, you know, when I wrote about Carl Jung, uh, I had to go, I had to get my German up to speed, and I had to go and live in Zurich. And uh, when I wrote about uh, Saul Steinberg, uh, I had to enter the art world, the contemporary art world. And uh, when I wrote about Ani Isnin, and you did get that right, <laughs> uh, when I wrote about her, um, I had to deal with an estate and with family members and with archives. And, uh, so, and then with Capone, with Al Capone, that was such fun. Um, I got to meet his family. And I've become very close to his granddaughters, who are wonderful women. So, you know, 
I think anyone who claims that there is one method, one methodology, um, is putting himself or herself into a box, um, and they really should stay out of that box. Can we back up just to Al Capone for a moment, because I was so fascinated. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I resisted the temptation to see sort of a through line in all of the subjects you chose. Um, what, how did you discover that as a project? What drew you to that? Is there, is there, was there like an aha moment where you're like, I gotta write about this guy? Well, you know, they, um, I have this wonderful British friend uh, with a wonderful British accent, which I will not even try to imitate. But um, one day I said to her, um, where does your inspiration come from? Because people often ask me where my inspiration comes from, and I often don't know how to answer that question. And she said, oh, Deirdre, I just sit there and I wait for the little bird of inspiration to fly over and shit upon my head. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what happened to me with Al Capone. I was sitting at my desk, I was uh, uh, copy editing the Steinberg manuscript, and um, one of my friends uh, in publishing phoned me and she said um, her brother was a lawyer who represented a young man who believed that he was descended from the illegitimate son of Al Capone. And he wanted to find out who he really was and he was interested in writing a book and did I have any advice? And I said, well, what does he want? Does he want a ghostwriter? Does he want to write a memoir? Does he want an ad told to? Well, he didn't know what he wanted. So he and his father and a couple of his uncles got on the phone with me. We had a conference call. One thing led to another. And I went to Chicago, still thinking I'm going to help them find a way to bring their book into being. And suddenly I thought, all these books that have been written about Al Capone have stressed his criminal life, but nobody has looked at the personal life. Nobody has looked at the family, at the man. And so I phoned my own editor and said, you're not gonna believe this, but I wanna write about Al Capone. <laughs> and that's how it started. That's great, thank you. Uh, we have time for another question or two. Who's up? Uh, right there. Well, I love biographies so much, so when you put books on your nightstand that are other people's biographies that have been written by other people, who do you, who do you go to? Well, the books that I read before I go to bed are what I call my harmless fluff. I go to my little local library um, once a week and I bring home 10 or 12 of whatever new fiction and new nonfiction has come out. And I generally read that uh, before I go to sleep. But the books that are always <laughs> on my nightstand um, I, I sometimes have a novel by Balzac, or I'll have uh, something by Trollope, put me to sleep, 500 words, put me to sleep. But I always have Montaigne, I always have Montaigne. And um, I read uh, Montaigne's essays, I dip into them, uh, I just open the book at random. And I find, you know, if the day has been tough, if the work hasn't gone well, if my plumbing has broken down or my car hasn't started and I'm going to bed worrying about how I'm gonna deal with everything the next day, you just read 10 pages of Montaigne and you have a smile on your face and you go to sleep. The difference between writing about someone who is living and someone who is deceased. Uh, yeah. Please uh, comment. <laughs> uh, when they're, when they're no longer living, you have to deal with, generally, with estates if, if they're um, a, a, relati a relatively recent death, as in the case of Anis Nin, I had to deal with her estate. And uh, fortunately, the estate get granted me this. I mean, I am so fortunate. I have, every book I've written, I've written the way I wrote the Beckett book with complete freedom to write the book that I want. And I know a lot of other writers don't have that kind of freedom. So for me, uh, dealing with the uh, estate um, uh, was, uh, I wish I'd had her. I wish I'd had her to talk to uh, because I wrote that book right after I wrote Beauvoir and I was used to talking to my subjects. But for me, there, there really hasn't been all that much difference, although I know so many biographers are absolutely in anguish over having to deal with estates and get permissions and copyrights and all that nonsense. Well, before you all join us upstairs for the book signing, one more round of applause for Deirdre Bear.